anesthesiologist, and I also direct the Ketamine Infusion Clinic, where I help patients overcome the most challenging mental and physical health struggles that they've had to, <clears throat> they've been trying to overcome for months, years, and sometimes decades. And today I'm going to share something that most pregnant women never think about, nor do elderly men and women who are having surgery, and that's the psychedelic experience's relevance to cesarean sections, and for that matter, any surgery. I'm here in an operating room right now, a real life operating room with the lights, with the bed, and with all the medications that we use to keep you alive during surgery. And they have incredible relevance to patients that learn how to tap into their inner healing potential when they're having psychedelic experiences. And I'm gonna share one of them in particular, and that's relevant to the epidural that I have here in my hand. This is an epidural catheter. For any men or women who have had an epidural or a spinal, it's a similar deal there. This is a flexible nylon catheter. You can see it's very soft, it's not harmful. We inject medications like this lidocaine and bupivacaine through it, and it allows for profound numbness of parts of the body where surgery is taking place. We monitor you when you're having that infusion through, like the monitors that I'm connected to myself as well. I'll get to why I'm connected to the monitors in a moment. It's all very relevant to the mind-body experience that patients have or during any psychedelic experience or during surgery because many of our anesthetics can have potential psychedelic properties depending on the set and setting that they get those medications in. And that is why cesarean sections have so much to teach us, men and women alike, about what our mindset has to do with our healing and our ability to accomplish things that we didn't think possible before. Deborah, good to see you. Heidi, Debbie, uh, Robin, Jay, Catherine, fantastic. Hey, Darian, good to see you too. Uh, and Little Cobra, I haven't seen you before. CMD Blary, great. Let's get to one of the most fascinating secrets of medicine that most patients really don't know about. And this is crazy because half of the population are women and the majority are gonna have a child at some point and many of whom will have a spinal or an epidural. I showed you the epidural already, right? That's this little flexible guy. And the spinal needle is, I've got one here. These are expired products and stuff. They're not like I'm wasting random things just so you know. People always end up asking me. This is a spinal needle, kind of a thicker one, but get the idea. This goes in the back to inject numbing medication to the parts of the spine that conduct, that have the nerves that conduct sensation to the parts where the surgery is happening. So set and setting are incredible because they determine the mindset that we bring to any type of experience. That is all, by the way, revealed on the life support monitors that you're connected to, like I'm connected to right now. This is a window into my body, by the way, because you can tell how stressed I am or how anxious I am based on the questions you're asking me, like the difference between spinal epidural, see Amy, I saw your question, we'll get to that in a minute. But based on all the monitors here, you can take a window to my body. You can see my pulse fertility index, my heart rate variability, if I'm tachycardic or not. Well, when you're having a C-section, your vitals look, they have a certain pattern depending on the mindset that you bring into the operating room. The other group of folks that get spinals and epidurals are often those uh, maybe elderly who are having hip replacements or knee replacements. I do spinals for them all the time. Or epidurals, usually spinals. So it's the same type of anesthesia for the spinal, but and this is the part that I hope you'll really focus on because it's fascinating. When a woman is having a spinal or an epidural, they're just getting the spinal, they're getting the bupivacaine, for example, just a local anesthetic, no relaxation properties like propofol or midazolam, like a benzodiazepine, or uh, opioids. They're just getting bupivacaine and they're numb in the area and they don't get a drop of anything else. And they have a successful childbirth and their vitals certainly show the physiological trauma of the childbirth. But compare that to the older people. 
This is the, the, the kicker for me. When I do the same type of spinal or epidural for an elderly individual who's going to have a hip or knee replacement, they get the same bupivacaine that numbs the nerves, but I also give them a good dose of propofol and Versed or midazolam and fentanyl. But why? Why is it that the woman who's having this invasive abdominal surgery goes through the whole process without any drop of IV anesthesia, but the old man or woman having hip or knee surgery gets a boatload of sedation from us, even though they're numb in the area where the surgery is happening? I want to get your thoughts on that before I explain the reason that I see in patients that explains the psychedelic experience and what it has to do with cesarean sections. Um, so I want to see somebody answer that question. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to say that uh, I've got to answer the spinal versus epidural. So guys, an epidural, just to remind you all, this stays under your skin about five, six centimeters past your skin, this flexible tube, to continuously deliver the local anesthetic. That's different than the spinal that I showed you. is just a needle. It goes in and out of your back, one shot injection of local anesthetic. It doesn't stay there like an epidural catheter does. That's the main difference um, for C. Amy who asked, or C. Amy. Hey, by the way, if you're learning something, I would appreciate it if you hit that like button and share with others what you learned. I don't do product placement or ads. I just want to share information for you all to better learn how you can tap into your inner healing potential like we're talking about with the case of cesarean sections and psychedelics. With that said, who has answered my question? Uh, it's not good for the baby, and Darian says their older people are more nervous. Excellent. You're both uh, are right to an extent. So we like to avoid IV anesthesia agents to a woman who is in the process of delivery because anything that goes in your IV is going to reach your placenta, and many things cross the placental barrier. And if it's anesthetic, it'll certainly cross the baby's blood-brain barrier. And giving birth to a child who is, pardon me, but high on opioids or on something else poses risks because we may need to intubate the child, support the breathing, etc. Not ideal if it can be avoided. Not always, but if we can avoid it, it's typically safer. On top of that. If we give something like midazolam to a delivering woman who's having a C-section, we might calm their anxiety in a moment, but we also remove their memory formation. We cause anterograde amnesia, meaning that they're not going to remember their child being born. That could be an experience that they've been cherishing or been anticipating and want to actually have with them, and robbing them of that memory might not be ideal either. That's in addition to other considerations, but we'll leave it at that. We have reason not to give IV medications. The other big difference, and this is what Darian was saying about anxiety in the elderly, well, please, this is the part, it's the set and setting in the mindset. That woman, this is the crux of it all, guys, has had nine months or so to prepare for this one moment of childbirth. The, Elderly man or woman may have been preparing for their near hip surgery for a couple weeks. I don't know, a couple months at most. In those nine months, what has the brain of the pregnant woman been doing to prepare for certainly an invasive delivery? If you're having a C-section, there's going to be pain associated with it, all sorts of risks, placenta previa, placental abruptions, uterine ruptures, etc. Yet, they do this without a drop of anxiety medication in the IV every day all around the world. And it's because of the mindset they have brought in. It's simply not there in the majority of patients that I have in the operating room for hip or knee surgeries or other surgeries, like, uro like uh, urological surgeries, where we may also do a spinal. And that is so telling that even without any medication, shoot, you can hear my heart rate almost going up as I'm talking about this. It makes the hairs on the back of my neck kind of go up because it shows how powerful set and setting are whenever we're giving any medications at all or doing anything to help heal somebody. And the same goes for psychedelics. If somebody's having LSD or ketamine as a party drug, your mindset is somewhere totally different than somebody coming to me for a therapeutic ketamine infusion or somebody coming into the operating room, for example, with all this anxiety and hyped up sympathetic nervous system drive. 
how is their body going to respond to the anesthesia, to my hypnotic suggestions, to the love and compassion and care that everyone in this room is providing that patient versus the patient that comes in calm and receptive to that love, compassion, and yeah, the effects of <laughs> disinhibiting medications. It's a reality of surgery and anesthesia. But just like that woman who comes in for a C-section and undergoes invasive surgery without a drop of sedation, of anti-anxiety medication, of additional pain medication, what can we accomplish if we could also tune our minds and bodies, if we're having a psychedelic experience or even not? Remember, you don't need to have psychedelics to achieve the powerful tapping into our inner healing potential. Psychedelics certainly can make it faster, but it's not necessary or required by any means. What if you, <laughs> I know a lot of comments have come in. Um, I would love to know what people's thoughts are on the cesarean sections. Uh, Heidi, I agree, our bodies are amazing. Um, but there's a bunch of questions that I promised I would answer, so let us get to those two. What can be done to help extreme anxiety during a C-section? Uh, Brian, the same things that help severe anxiety before any type of surgery. It's the three C's, sometimes I make it four C's. Uh, it's curiosity, natural antidote to anxiety, as is certainty, sense of control, and confidence. And these are all things that I help my patients with before surgery, certainly to gain control of anxiety because it's hard to be anxious and curious at the same time. It's hard to be anxious and in control at the same time. They're almost mutually exclusive. It's hard to be anxious and confident in what you're doing at the same time. And <laughs> fostering curiosity, empowering patients with confidence to give them a sense of control and certainty are all our natural antidotes to anxiety. Of course, I'll use the anti-anxiety medications in the moment for safety. If someone's having a panic attack on the operating room table, I'm not gonna you know, sprinkle valerian root and just do hypnotic suggestions. No, if there's a need, and this is where there's always clinical judgment in our years of experience, we have to know when to use what clinical tool. I connected myself to monitors here. I haven't even talked about it yet because <laughs> The psychedelic experience and how it relates, the mind mindset, how it relates to cesarean sections just is so fascinating. I didn't even explain what this is other than to say that it's a window to my body. You can see how relaxed my blood vessels are based on my pulsatility index here in blue, by the way. You can also see that I've connected the pulse ox to my earlobe. And you may be wondering, doctor, why is it on your earlobe? It's to emphasize that the mindset that I have that influences the numbers that you see there, affects not only my heart beating or my brain, but even affects the blood vessels in the tiny blood vessels in my earlobe. That's right, my earlobe is experiencing whatever neural impulses are being generated from my brain, transmitted to the heart and to all the blood vessels in my body. Your body is all connected. It's not woo hooey, hippy dippy stuff. This is hardcore medicine because I make life or death decisions based on this little probe on a patient's ear or on their nose or in their lips. Because what happens in the ear, here, just listen to my heartbeat as I breathe in a conscientious way. My earlobe is experiencing the difference in the blood flow just like how any other part of my body is. Take a listen. Did you all hear the heart rate variability change? My earlobe is, is sensing the same difference. You hear it going up again right now. It's because the body's connected. We can't try to separate all the organs from each other and say, oh, this medication is just for the brain. This medication is just for this. A highly reductionist approach is a disservice to patients outside of emergency settings. In the operating room, that's how we practice medicine. That's what I do. But once I leave the operating room, I leave the emergency room, we need to be looking at the body as a whole and looking at lifelong consequences of what we do, not just in the moment, whack-a-mole approaches to medicine. So, uh, Laura Amos, I'm doing very well today. Thank you. Um, Julia Lane, have I heard of POTS? Yes. Someone asks me pretty much on a daily basis on social media about POTS. Yes, I am familiar with it. Many patients in surgery have it and they do very well 
when they heads up me about it first. Brenda, good to see you. Uh, Catherine, I love your comments. Julia Lane, I'll have to watch this video. <laughs> Julia, thank you for the kind comments. Um, Kendall, does the oxytocin that the mom releases have anything to do with it? Probably. Kendall, oxytocin affects far more than just our emotions. It affects the heart, blood vessels. Uh, probably has pain, really, pain modulating effects. I don't, not that I'm aware of specifically, but I certainly would not be surprised. Because if nothing else, when pain is in the brain, when we have emotions that are pushing our brain into a certain extreme, like the rush of oxytocin that comes out with childbirth, it does change your brain's ability to perceive pain. So I believe you're right on that. Does the older population, asks Monica, require less anesthesia because of their age? Yes, they do. Very well said. Brian Faith, what happens if a woman has a panic attack during a C-section? What do you guys do in those cases? If there is an overt panic attack, depends on how serious it is, depends on what else is going on. There's not a one-size-fits-all answer, but there might be a role for something like propofol to break that panic attack if the benefits of propofol outweigh the risks. Good question. Robin says, my epidural with my last baby. She's 32. Congratulations. I hope she appreciates what she went through. Was intense and wouldn't wear off. I was hospitalized for three days, says Robin, because I had no feeling in my lower body. The ob guy said he hadn't seen it before. Well, it is pretty unlikely to have a three-day-long epidural. That being said, depending on how much was infused for how long, the effects can last certainly longer than short durations. Um, Madison Depoy, I think it's the first time I've seen you on here. What are some things you wish you knew before becoming an anesthesiologist? <laughs> That's a loaded question, Madison. But suffice to say that I, um, I don't think there was anything else I wish I had known about anesthesia. I wish I had known how powerful these medications can be to help holistically heal patients and better appreciate the role of psychedelic medicine in an operating room like this one that we're in right now and how much biofeedback can completely alter. Oh, sorry. A couple more minutes? Thank you. <laughs> How much biofeedback can empower patients and ourselves to overcome challenging conditions without medications? Um, what does a cyst on the kidney mean? Brenda, it can mean anything. Typically, it's what we call an incidentaloma, but it depends on what fluid is in that cyst. If it's a bloody cyst versus just the serous fluid cyst, it means two different things. Teresa Lynn, good to see you again. Uh, Ord Flyer says, wondering, my wife, when she has given, no, oh, English is kind of all over the place, got an epidural, her blood pressure dropped, she bottomed out. Why did her, okay, all right, why did your blood pressure bottom out when you get this little plastic catheter in your body? Good question. When you get the plastic catheter into the epidural space outside your spinal cord, we give medication like lidocaine in it. Lidocaine does what? Paralyzes sodium channels. It, sodium channel blocker. Paralyzes muscles, both in your legs, but also the, the blood vessel, the, pardon, the muscles in your blood vessels. It causes what we call a vasoplegia, literally paralyzing blood vessels, causing them to dilate, get fat like that, and that lowers blood pressure. Very stereotypical response, and we treat it often ahead of time with phenylephrine or ephedrine. Teresa says, I'm pretty good at being anxious and curious. Well, Teresa, maybe there's a different level of curiosity that you can engage into or a different type of curiosity to help push the anxiety out of the question. But I'm so happy that you shared your experience. Heidi, what causes blood pressure to drop so much before and especially after surgery? So before the incision of surgery starts, you've gotten a massive dose of anesthesia, whether it be white stuff like propofol, ketamine, etomidate, gases from the anesthesia machine. These naturally dilate blood vessels, depress myocardial function, aka make your heart not beat as strongly, and those all cause blood pressure to drop. After surgery, blood pressure can either go up or down depending on many factors though. So I don't have a good answer. It's not consistent, I'll say, for after. Um, Lalita, how to avoid a C-section? Well, gosh, Lita, that depends on so many factors that I, I can't, nothing consistent 
And I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on what can prevent a C-section. <laughs> um, typically, the more uncomplicated the pregnancy, typically the less need for a C-section, but many things happen beyond our control that necessitate C-sections as well, as well, so it's never blaming an individual mother for that. Tatiana says, thanks for the videos. Tomorrow I will go to visit my tutor in anesthesia. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, well, hey, I hope you have a good experience, Tatiana. Thank you for the kind comments. Jay says, I'm an avalanche of anxiety in OR. No wonder why anesthesiologist slams mask on my face. Uh, next trip, I will be in control. Jay, I'm so happy to hear that. I hope everyone feels inspired from what you've been through and how you're going to get in the, uh, the driver's seat and take control. Because like we said earlier, control tends to be mutually exclusive with anxiety to an extent. I'm really happy to hear that, Jay. Um, Brian, this is truly relieving my fear of giving birth in two months, big time. Thank you so much. Well, Brian, thank you for being vulnerable and for taking the initiative to learn about your body and what to expect. Because when you have expectations, you can now have confidence and certainty for what's going to happen. When you don't have expectations, it's kind of hard to be prepared. You prepare to give a speech, you prepare to run a race, but we don't often think about preparing our minds, having the right mindset set and setting for experiences that could be transformative to our health, like the psychedelic experiences inside or outside the operating room. Certainly in my infusion practice, the preparation and integration of a psychedelic experience are probably far more emphasized than the actual infusion itself. The same goes for my surgeries. When I have a patient for uh, the operating room, I call them the night before, like I did earlier today, to help answer their questions, to give them the confidence that they want to have the surgery, why they want to have the surgery, the certainty and the expectations of what's going to happen to their body so that they can help overcome the anxiety which has deleterious consequences if left unmanaged before surgery. We can talk about that, I've mentioned it in so many other videos as well. Um, Darian, what made me want to be an anesthesiologist? It's an awesome job. I agree. Uh, it's because I was an engineer in undergrad and I was fascinated by devices and anesthesia has some of the most, I don't know, lack of a better word, awesome devices. What I'm connected to now, the ventilator I'm sitting on right now, this is some of the most fascinating technology, human interfaces in medicine. All right. Um, Jay says, I didn't think deep breathing really helped until seeing your TikToks and lives, life changing. Fantastic. <laughs> Jay, I'm so happy to hear that. Hey, I'll do it one more time for you, and then we're going to wind down for tonight. But Julia is asking, do redheads need more anesthesia? One of the most common questions I get after POTS. Um, short answer is about 10% more. But that's only for certain anesthesia agents, not all of them, like not the white stuff. But the gas out of the machine does have about 10% higher requirements. Great question. Uh, all right. Let's do one last breathing exercise together. I know we didn't get to every question here, but we'll be on again. Um, Chris is saying, can I have surgery if I have severe sleep apnea? Uh, well, yeah, but you have to discuss it with your anesthesiologist to make the proper uh, accommodations for safety. Okay, so how I help patients get in control, like Jay was saying, is we do a breathing technique together before we fall asleep. Because, I mean, you're already getting the breathing mask here, right? you got to take those big deep breaths, might as well do them mindfully in a way that we know increases vagal tone and decreases anxiety to help you gain control over what your vagus nerve is telling your heart to do. And it's very easy, it only takes a couple of breaths to engage it. And you can tell off the monitors in just a minute what happens to my heart when I do it. So I'm going to stop moving around so that the numbers on here are consistent. And I'm going to breathe in for five seconds and breathe out for five seconds. So it's about 10 seconds per breath, about six breaths a minute. Listen to this. One, two, three. Did everyone hear that? Do it one more time for you. All right, and 
my PI is 0 0.17. Um, was hanging around 0 0.12 when I checked the last. <laughs> and so even the pulsatility index has increased despite me talking and you know being bombarded by questions. It goes to show just how much your mindset can affect all these parameters of your body because the nerves in your brain can affect nerves all over your body. And that's really empowering for patients when they're in an operating room like this with the lights, with the scary table, hopefully with the not scary anesthesiologist, but it helps empowerment. And like we said, empowerment is one of the antidotes to anxiety. Until next time, guys, remember that you have more power over your health than you've probably ever been told. I'd appreciate it if you hit that like button or share what you learned with others or follow to keep up with all my lives. I don't like to do eye placement. I just want to sell you guys the knowledge that you need to empower yourselves to better be in control of your lives and your health. Till next time. Uh, oh, Catherine, I can answer your questions because you're always there. Do I get anxious sometimes? Of course I do. But I use the same techniques that we talked about today to help overcome them safely and without medications when possible. Till next time. Oh, it's funny. It's right where the camera is. All right.